Hi, I'm Mike Bush. I'm Paul New. And I'm Colleen Sterling. Welcome to Ask the AMPs from AOPA. On Ask the AMPs, we take your toughest maintenance questions and, and attempt to answer them. So if you have a question, um, please reach out to us at podcasts at AOPA.org. And if you like the show, make sure to follow or subscribe so you never miss an episode. And if you'd like to get on our email list uh, for our monthly newsletter and um, um, maintenance stories, uh, the easiest way to do that is to text the word SAVVY, S-A-V-V-Y, to 33777. And a little text bot will ask you for your email address and put you on the list. It's, uh, text the word SAVVY, S-A-V-V-Y, to 33777 to put yourself on the list. Everybody got home from Oshkosh okay? Was that the right question? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, got, <laughs> I, I took the long way home. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Paul uh, flew a Cirrus to uh, Air Venture. It wasn't his. Unfortunately, <laughs> and he didn't steal um, it. it was the, and, uh, <laughs> and and it was uh, it was parked in the in the display area, and uh, Paul needed needed to get get home on Sunday, and it turned out that the airplane could not be extracted from the display area um, until late Sunday night. So um, uh, after much negotiation with the powers that be at EAA trying to figure out a way to levitate that airplane out of where it was stuck. Uh, I wound up uh, uh, taking the long way home and, and, and dropping Paul off in, uh, in Jackson, Tennessee. And, and thank you again. Last time, last year, you got me a ride to Oshkosh. Uh-huh. And then on someone else's airplane coming home, this is becoming routine. I oh, but the, you know, the yeah. really, the really good part of it, Paul paid for the gas. Yeah, right? there you go. <laughs> what a man. That's <laughs> awesome. That's the least. And, and a twin, no less. Oh. And, and it was $7 and something a gallon. Yeah. Too. And was, he didn't even, I mean, I didn't see any any facial expressions or anything. No, no grimacing anything. or anything. I know you went home and cried afterwards, but at well, least a little I didn't bit. Get to see it. I did wince a bit. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, the uh, my Cirrus is still down where I made the swap out with the other Cirrus. Oh, and, and I'm trying to, I'm still trying to figure out how to get there because I have a trip coming up next Wednesday. So I've got to get my airplane back. Oh my gosh. Your logistics are making me dizzy. I mean, all <laughs> we did was get on a commercial flight to Chicago and drive up and it was well, what, what, non-eventful. Why isn't, why isn't Blake taking you down there? <laughs> well, that's, see, that's the thing. Blake still has to, uh, he has to change the oil in his warrior. And then once that's done, the annual is finished. But he's got to have an instructor fly with him down there because he's not not signed off for that yet. Oh, he's not. Oh. Si- he, he can't, yeah, he's not and he can't find an instructor. Solo cross country. Uh-huh. Aren't so, you an instructor, Paul? No, not, no, no. no. Not, he's resisted the urge. I'm. I've. <laughs> that's. I, I would say I'm smarter than that. Maybe I'm. I'm just. I don't know what it is, but yeah, uh, a little more self preservation than to be an instructor. Mm-hmm. It, it, true to life, instructors that do it every day. Bless them. I'm telling you, they're brave <laughs> yeah. souls. Yeah. They have to fly with people like me. And, I, you know, so now we're just trying to find a, a pilot maybe that can fly, fly the two of us down there. And so I can get my airplane back. Well, well I've, been, I've, been, <laughs> I've been going to air venture every year for longer than I can remember. And uh, I think the, the weather this year was the best I can ever recall. Oh, it's awesome. Um, yeah. I have this little ritual every year right before uh, air venture starts that I, I say a prayer, um, uh, <laughs> praying for a big womp and coal front to come through air venture right before the show, clear out all the hot air and, and, and give us a week of good weather. And, it and finally this worked. week, my, this, th- th- this year, my prayer was answered. Um, Big wampin' storm came through on Saturday about 6.30, took down tree limbs and power lines, flipped a couple of airplanes. Wamp and when I, when I arrived at 10.30 the next morning, uh, Sunday morning, it was absolutely glorious. Now, Paul was silly <laughs> enough to arrive Saturday. Saturday. We right, got there about, right what, 4.30. I, I arrived. I landed yeah. on the orange dot, runway 27, 
precisely at my assigned 4.15 arrival time, which yeah, yeah. would not have happened had I not had to vector around the storms. Had I yeah. vectored around the storms, I would have been way off my time. But somehow that, that I had to go all around Chicago and everything. But I landed and I took a picture because it's not every day that you get to taxi up to Boeing Square yeah. and they hook a, a tow on you. And, you know, so I rode on the wing like I was somebody. There wasn't anybody there to see me, but yeah. you know, I, I still, everybody was running away from the storm. <laughs> everybody, <laughs> just about the time we got the airplane tied down at the display area, it, it, here it came. It just crashed. It was something else. Where where yeah. were you when it came through? Were you still on the grounds or did you get under? I'd just gotten somewhere? to the house when the oh, worst good. of it hit. I walked in the house, turned on the lights and sat down and thought, this is really nice. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you turned on the lights and then the lights went off or something. No, like no, I, I didn't lose power. Unlike an awful lot of folks in mm -hmm. Oshkosh, yeah. lost a lot of power. And then he did the bachelor thing and went out and got himself a pizza. That's what that's exactly what I did. He sat around in his underwear <laughs> eating pizza. <laughs> I did. I went down to the parm and got a pizza and it was yeah, really good. Where's yeah. the selfie that you took of that? No, no, I didn't didn't take that one. <laughs> Our first question is from Douglas, who is a fellow cardinal owner who is spinning around with his mechanic. Go ahead, Douglas. Yeah, oh, hi. Um any rate, uh, I had an an annual or we started an annual just uh uh, last month here, and uh, we decided to pull the uh, pull the prop uh, and change the alternator belt because uh, the the nose was pushing in and grinding away half of it, but there was also cracks in it. So, uh, and while we we're in there, we decided also that we would uh, change the uh, uh, front seal. Uh, that would uh, there was some minor leakage there, but it's a, while you're there. But unfortunately, what we found was that the uh, what's called the front bulkhead of the uh, uh, spinner is uh, uh, damaged, uh, and the damage consists of uh, uh, some destruction of the holes of, uh, in the front bulkhead of, of the nose cone. And... Uh, yeah, and there's a strange depression at each one of the bolt heads. Uh, I also had a question about the fact that in the both the uh, the uh, parts catalog and the service manual, they don't show washers under those um, bolts. But I assume washers under those bolts is a good idea. So, and I don't think that has anything necessarily to do with the problem here. But uh, what happened is there a depression has occurred around each where each one of those washers was that is uh, uh, almost an eighth of an inch deep, I would say, maybe maybe even more. Uh, they look the same when you first look at it, but I'm sure there are slight differences. I don't know if you, if you look at it like this, you can see the little mountains on the on the yeah. top of there. Oh, and, uh, yeah, you you sent us a, a, a nice picture of it, nice so picture. I guess okay, we, got, we got a pretty good uh, look at it. I, most people don't mention me and nice picture in the same sentence, <laughs> but that's good. Uh, I feel your pain. All right. So, uh, any rate, uh, I did some uh, looking back, and the prop was off uh, February 1 of 1997 uh, to have the prop serviced, mm -hmm. and um, – and, uh, and then 206 hours later, uh, and, and don't do the math, please. It's embarrassing. Uh, the um, in October of 2004, we put in a new engine. A, well, a, a remand from Lycoming, so the prop was off then. So that was 206 hours, and everything looked fine when it came off the first time. Everything looked fine. It came off the second time, according to my uh, mechanic. Uh, who's done all the work on my plane for several decades here now. Um, and then uh, another 228 uh, hours on the plane. So that brings us up to current, which is it's at 2382 uh, on the TAC, uh, is when we were doing this uh, uh, annual and found this problem. So in just, uh, you know, 228 hours of flying, not flying enough. Uh, we got that damage that you have the picture of. Now I had a couple questions. Why do why don't don't they show uh, washers on the in the in the uh, manuals for this? 
and uh, why were there washers there? Uh, is that is that good? I don't think that had anything to do with the problem, though. Uh, in fact, if the washers weren't there, he might have had problems getting to the bolt heads to unbolt them. <laughs> so anyway, uh, any thoughts? I'm not, oh, I'll, I'll add that my mechanic keeps trying to think that somehow water seeped in there and pushed this ahead and created those dimples there. <laughs> wow, I'm, uh, that's crazy. I'm not, I like that, yeah. <laughs> I'm not at all a fan of that theory. Like the uh, rocks that move around on the desert and it, leave the trails? Yeah, that's right. Well, that's how the rocks split in the, you know, too. So, uh, so hey, yeah, that's it. Yeah, go right ahead. Let's paint a picture for the people that can't see this, um, although we have the picture there. there you uh, go. Yeah. So you have the spinner, and the spinner is what attaches to the spinner backing plate, which is what you're showing. And I'm trying yeah. to remember, the prop is bolted to the crankshaft, and then the backing plate is um, attached. Uh, well, this is the forward yeah, bulkhead. They, the they call it a forward and backward bulkhead. And the back bulkhead is bolted to the uh, flywheel. Flywheel, okay. right? Okay. And, and the and then uh, you have uh, that's where most of the connection to the to the uh, nose cone is. The spinner, uh, yeah. And it's got uh, twenty, I think, uh, bolt, uh, bolts and and then yeah, this, there's this just is three that go to the front of 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 this guy. You know, it, it's got uh, three along the edge. And uh, now uh, uh, that's it. I'm I'm baffled. What what really baffles me is that uh, you know why am I so lucky? Because I put this out to the uh, the Cardinal Flyers Group CFO, the right. Cardinal Flyers organization, and and uh, Cardinal Flyers Online, I guess is what that stands for. And uh, I did get some responses about who might maybe maybe would fix it. Tell me you'll fix it, Paul. Uh, no. Anyway, <laughs> no. well, so uh, here's here's what this is though. This is the forward bulkhead. So this mounts. That's on the, the forward one, right? It mounts on the front side of the propeller. That's correct. I don't remember this piece having the uh, the detents where the bolts are. And my recollection is that it's flat. It's flat. It I is. also um, don't believe you're going to be able to get that repaired. No. Um, there's, it, you're not going to cut it out and rivet something stretch. to right. it. Right. You can't yeah. do that. But if, if it can be repaired, there's one company that, that is authorized to repair these things. Um, okay. and you probably okay. should send a photo to them and it's, uh, it, it pretty easy to remember. It's called spinnerrepair.com. I think the company's named <clears throat> ASEI or something, yeah. but there are the URL is spinnerrepair.com and, and they have been known to work miracles they're all there are to do weld repairs and stuff there are more than one companies there's k and k which i've used to oh weld yeah my spinner that's right. that's right and they specifically say they repair bulkheads oh that's yeah. good uh, i didn't know they because, could do bulkheads bulk, k &K bulkhead the cracking is in the milwaukee area uh it is in east troy wisconsin and there you go. They're that's what i'm talking about yeah uh my mechanic has already talked to them Okay. Um, and that, and they were mentioned also by a the couple Cardinal. of people from CFO. Yes. But uh, so I'm glad we got another person to contact here. But uh, that said, I, I'm an that's... engineer, and I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, convinced that can't be repaired. But that's me. It, well, but it might it, be it, very it, expensive. It's not a question of whether it can be repaired. Yeah. It's a question of whether it may be repaired. Yes. Yeah. You may find it's less expensive ah. to. Oh, obtain oh, a new one or use oh, one. No, you, uh, you you just simply not allowed to to, yeah. to yeah. rivet doublers and stuff right. to those. It's things. not a you field repair. Yeah. So they couldn't do a weld repair on this. They'd have to put new material oh, on basically because yeah, it's so. Well, deformed. they may do a weld repair, but this it's not going to be a simple. The, the, repair. the only kind of repair they can do is a weld repair. <clears throat> yeah. 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 yeah that's yeah, they're not going to attach say. something to it. They I don't know what they right. would do. But uh, you know, this is not something your field mechanic is going to do. You're not going to rivet something oh, no, to it, can't nothing do it. like that. No, yeah. I, I recognize it's got to be done by, you know, uh, some qualified machinist here. Right. Well, uh, it's not just that. It's going to have to be a certified repair because there's right. not an approved repair for this part. Okay. So it's going to have to go to someone that has an approval to do whatever their process is. Right. Yeah, the other thing that it, concerns me is why it's damaged. Yeah. Not water. Uh, <laughs> no, not it's, water. It's, it's, it's obviously damaged because it yeah. because it was it was, was loose and moving. Yeah, around. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had one theory, but I can't see how it would do it. And my mechanic says, oh, no. But uh, the one thing that changed was the new engine. All the other parts were the same. Okay. Well, but no, just bear, bear, bear with me a second. And if uh, so, if the bolts did bottomed out or for some reason reached torque before it was all compressed together, uh, but still the propeller will be pushing against the uh, this part. And I would I don't see where the where the formation of the of the dents comes out of that. But maybe you do. Also, I'm a little I'm a little bothered that the thing was assembled apparently, at least from what you say, I haven't researched it, uh, with a different stack up than what's in the manual. No, he uh, said there were no washers. There, there, there were no. He said washers. there were no washers in the no. manual, but they were, right. but washers exactly. were actually installed. Yeah, and and uh, uh, and if, if the uh, manual was, says, says no washers, I would certainly. There were no, that there, that, when I looked at the picture, I said, why don't they have why don't they have washers on that? Well. Uh, of course, my mechanic does what too many do. Uh, they they put back the parts that were there, and uh, and that's the way it came in, you know. And and he's done it uh, obviously uh, once before without any problem. And the only thing that changed was the engine. Um, but the uh, engine itself is not going to be the cause. But yeah. installing well, the propeller after the engine might be the cause. Um, so getting, as Mike was saying, getting the prop bolts properly torqued, and you alluded to it there, if the prop bolts were to have bottomed out, then it feels like they're torqued when they're really not. Yeah. And things can move around quite a bit. So that would be the first suspect in my view. Well, that's that's my that's my suspicion. You mean, you mean like using wrong length bolts, Paul? Right. Yeah. If they if they bottomed out in the prop flange first, yeah. then it's going to be close. The propeller still is in there. And then you end up with the spinner wobbling at certain RPMs and eventually that begins to extrude that bulkhead. Right. Uh, and I'm, I'm kind of reaching a little bit here, but that's the only thing that I can think of that would make that happen. Uh, well, again, I, I tend to agree with that thinking. Um, but, but it didn't happen the first time it was changed out. And that's where I get back to, to the, to the engine somehow being the problem or uh, creating the problem. You, uh, uh, you know, when when you torque something down, uh, you think everything's tight because you got that torque, and uh, it's it's possible that there's a slight gap in there. That's what. That's well, what I when heard. you when you torque something, it's a matter of feel. If a bolt bottoms out, everything's turning fine, and then suddenly it hits torque. If it torques up properly, you're stretching a bolt, Mike wrote a wonderful article about this uh, a number of years ago. Uh, when you torque a bolt, it you're stretching it. And a really long bolt like these are, you're going to yeah. feel that. And so you you kind of approach the torque. It doesn't just suddenly happen. Uh, so normally when someone is torquing something up like that, they feel it. They feel it coming on. Well, I can't I can't speak for what he felt or, or, or anything like that. Uh, uh, but I still am baffled by it, and uh, apparently we all are. So, well, and I think like I said, the other thing that's odd is nobody else has ever had this problem. Apparently, no, I've never seen that. That's that's definitely. I don't think that's true. These these spinner components crack all the time. Like yeah. that? I mean, extruded like uh, that? That's well. Yeah. It, this one does look a little different, but no, uh, I mean it, that that extrusion thing. It, it it just it has it to moving. be some sort of installation error. <clears throat> yeah, it just yeah. has to be. So what you're going to have to do is replace it. I I don't think it's feasible. Well, to we've repair already it. we've already asked, or my mechanic has asked uh, Cessna, and I think in another year or two they might answer us. Yeah, and and if they do answer you, they're going to give you an answer you won't want to hear, which well, is very <laughs> high price. Well, tag. right now I I I, I will want to hear anything. I, so, but I would. I would be I would be scouring salvage yards for. for yeah, we already did all that. We've done okay. that. And you. And you know, I, I, I'm part of CFO. Uh, I asked people if they knew of any. You know, part of the problem is I don't know if it's different, but their uh, the part number is different for this than uh, the the uh, original model. This is a 177A, so there's only what 1,200 of those made or something. 
Yeah. And uh, so, uh, and it has a, a different part number than the than the uh, original 177, different dash number of the part number. I don't know if it's different, but I, I assume it must be, or they wouldn't so, change the number. And uh, uh, this is kind of, this is a sad idea to think about, but have you looked at some of the STC composite spinners i know that's yeah, like, going so, the long way around but so well, let me let me ask you how does that help me don't they still use this no part? no they do not no, or at least not the ones it? that i've used they have their own bulkheads uh that you attach to you know the aft bulkhead may be the same but you know, the ones that i've done not on cardinals on other airplanes came with their own forward bulkhead oh you make me feel better already and they well, and they don't and they don't fatigue they do. fracture like that yeah they do not crack so the I, I spoke to the um, president of the Cardinal Club today about this um, because yes, um, the Cardinal Club is a sponsor that's called TCB Composites, and they make composite spinners for Cardinals. They're certified, and the Cardinal site said they were working on a, a certified bulkhead uh, of composite material, and that it was supposed to be certified in 2019. So I asked Keith. <laughs> If, they, if he had an update and he said uh, TCB is apparently still working on it and maybe the people that had been working on that project had left the company, so it's in limbo. But I am not aware of a composite bulkhead right now for Cardinals. It seems to me that Douglas needs to call them and say, hey, I need to be your guinea pig. That's and not going to happen very fast. <sighs> I mean, I would, my, I would put my bet on salvage yard. Um, there's got to be one in salvage somewhere. It's... I, I'm sure you've looked, but I mean, well, uh, yeah, uh, my mechanic has looked, but he, you know, he's, he's used, they says they, they all have the same service or they're interconnected somehow. Well, and no. I, so let me, let me make a suggestion for you. Yes. Your mechanic. I, I don't know who your mechanic is. He's probably a wonderful guy, but, um, for him to spend hours and hours searching for a part, yeah. Uh, that's unpaid time. So you are far better equipped. Owners in general are far better equipped to go do that same search because you're calling all the same places. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Uh, and your motives are you're, you're so much more motivated. So I would just take that burden right off your mechanic and you go do the research and call all the salvage yards and everything. And all the salvage yards are not necessarily connected. You're talking about some of the parts finders, parts base right. and ILS and those. But this part may not be listed in their inventory. It may be sitting out on an airplane somewhere just in a pile and they have to go walk out to that, the hulk of a Cardinal that's left and kind of dig around and see if they still have the part. So it, it may not be listed in their inventory by part number. Not all the salvage yards disassemble the airplanes and itemize every single part that comes on. Yeah. A lot of them, just leave it in a pile out in the grass and wait till somebody calls. Okay. I mean, you know, I understand that, but there's, yeah. I also understand. I, I, I like the uh, SDC approach actually. Uh, well, if, give them a call. It doesn't hurt. Call, yeah. yeah. Call yeah. them. They, if they use it, if they ha are using a different piece, but you know, so often on, on the 177A, uh, oh yeah, we've got, we don't, we didn't cover the 177A. Is, yeah. You know, there's no sure. no reason for them to. Yeah, um, yeah, doesn't the, pay. The, yeah. the size of that market is minuscule. Yeah. So, okay. Well, well cool that you ideas. found him, Colleen. I had no idea. I was just taking a stab in the dark. <laughs> about the composite. <laughs> about the composite. Yeah. I, I, I should have known you would have found it. <laughs> no, I once had a composite TB, TCB spinner on my Cardinal. I got mm. rid of it because it was out of round and it oh. cracked my. Backing plate, now that I remember it. So I had yeah. to replace my backing plate probably 15 <laughs> years ago. And I swore off of composites and went back to metal. I, I wow. think a lot of those composites, don't they require the installation to to, to drill the holes? And floating. if they screw that up, you're screwed. You have to have floating yeah. nut plates. That's why I originally mm -hmm. put floating nut plates on my backer, yeah. backing. Yeah. But, but my spinner backing plate cracked at where the spinner attached to it. That's what I remember. Not these holes. I've never had any yeah. issues at all with these holes sure so yeah yeah that's why i'm convinced this was an installation error yeah I, I would agree well yeah yeah but you well, don't have a theory on the installation error because i mean the installation is pretty darn simple and that know, doesn't they, mean that it won't have errors uh well, it could have been be a bad the, torque be wrench it could have been a bad torque wrench it could have been the bolt bottomed out it could have been 
uh, any number hardware? of those things. Uh, yeah. so, these aren't studs. These are bolts, right? So they're, bolts. they're bolts. Yeah. They go into nut, nut plates that are built into the crankshaft hub. Yeah, yeah. Or a crankshaft flange. Well, I mean, right. it, it was either a bad part or a bad installation, and the likelihood of a, a bad part is much lower. So, yep. Yeah. Well, the part's been, been taken out and put back in before. So, I, you know, it, this happened in the last two, 228 hours. So, yeah. mm -hmm. okay. Well, um, I rest my case. Yeah. You rest your case. <laughs> no uh, quibbles. I, I yeah. wish you luck, Douglas. I know that you're down waiting for a part, and that's frustrating. Well, but, um, what's frustrating is losing flying time. Hey, I don't have that much yeah. left. I know, yeah. and you're still paying for hangar and insurance and everything, trying to, yeah, <laughs> I understand. Um, I, hey, hope, it, I hope you have hey, luck. Is it, is it legal to fly that thing without a spinner? I don't you think know. so. You know, I looked into that. that. So, yeah, it is not. the type certificate data sheets. Yeah. yeah, and it would alter the cooling into the engine. It's... Yeah. That's because I, I had to get rid of my spinner and get home. So I, I've looked into that. <laughs> no, you need to fix yeah. this. Yeah. JB Weld. No. <laughs> okay. Well, before what it's painful. Think? That's <laughs> right. He might take me seriously. He might. He right. That's the kind of thing, Weld, that's the kind of thing I would say, Mike. No. Okay. No, JB Weld right. won't work. Okay. Well, well thank you for calling. Guys. Douglas, it's, uh, it's a tough question, but uh, good luck with that. I hope you are able to find one soon. Well, we'll see. I'll, okay. I'll start having to do the call. I don't have time for that, guys. I, I don't know. even have my taxes done. Then pay your mechanic. See you all later. <laughs> see you, okay. Douglas. Yeah. Thanks for calling, Douglas. Bye bye. You bet. I'm good. Our next question is from Toby, is going to uh, educate us all on pressurization issues. How are you doing, Toby? Doing well. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me on. I appreciate it. So I um, own a 1977 tip tank model Cessna 414. Um, I have owned that airplane for over 12 years now. And in that time, I've had my fair share of pressurization issues, as I think many people with this type of airplane have. Um, and so I wanted to discuss kind of the troubleshooting process with you today and maybe throw out a, a kind of a headliner here, um, which is if you ask a mechanic if you just come up to a mechanic and say, hey, my 414 has pressurization issues, the pressurization is weak, then the mechanic will say, okay, let's hook up a pressurization cart and spray some soap on the fuselage and see where your leak is. And blow bubbles. <laughs> It'll yeah. blow bubbles, exactly. Yes, yes, that's that's the point of the soap. It, yeah, exactly. It's the, it's the Lawrence Welk show. <laughs> Tiny Sorry, <laughs> tiny. <bars. laughs> we went off the rail there. Uh -huh. And the, there is a certain issue with that, which I found out over the years through, um, I, let's say I've paid my tuition for that lesson, um, which is, I don't know if you remember the TV show House MD, um, House actually hates full body scans. And the reason why House hates full body scans is because they reveal always some minor flaw that they're going to go chase up, which is actually not what's causing the problem. And I've, I've discovered over the years that the pressurization cart and the soap on the fuselage is exactly that. Great comparison. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a good comparison. So the 420, 421, 414, all of those, um, and we were talking about it earlier. There's a lot of stuff that goes into that. It's interesting. We have a 210 that just showed up today and we hooked up the pressure cart. As a matter of fact, I got a text a few minutes ago asking if they could run the pressure cart. And uh, it was decided that it was way too, <laughs> way too noisy. So, <laughs> so for the podcast. apparently you guys wouldn't be able to hear me for the podcast, for the, yeah. for the pump. On a, on a 210, uh, you do need to go to a pressure cart first because there isn't anything involved. We have, we're just siphoning off the manifold pressure and it pumps right into the cabin. It's like dirt simple. Take the cowling off, it's connected, that part's done. But on your on your twin Cessna, there's a whole lot going on. You've got a lot of valves. You have two sources. Mm. Um, you have a heater that's forward of the false firewall. And what we've discovered is that if you've got a problem with pressurization and it's a leak, meaning something on the cabin side, if it's bubbles, you're not worried about it. 
Yeah. You're worried about something that's messing up your hairdo. You know, right. if, it, if it's not messing up your do, it's not enough of a leak to worry about. <laughs> exactly. Because if I'm going to complain to an AMP, I'm going to be missing like a P one PSI, one and a yeah. half PSI on pressurization. Yeah. Exactly. And that's going to be a big leak. Yeah. But now on the pressure side, I don't know. Mike, Mike had some thoughts on that uh, earlier. Um, I don't do much on twin Cessnas. But there's, yeah, well, uh, you know, it's, first of all, for for those of you listening who, who don't have a pressurized airplane, maybe we should explain a little of the basics of how pressurized airplanes work. But basically, um, the engine or engines, which are turbocharged in, in these airplanes, uh, provide um, pressure into the cabin. And, and then there's an outflow valve that is connected to a regulator that leaks the excess pressure out of the cabin in order to get the cabin pressure to what it's supposed to be. So the, the system has basically an inflow side, which provides stuff, uh, compressed air into the cabin. It's basically unregulated. And then an outflow side, which is which leaks the excess pressure off. And when you hook a pressure cart to the cabin, you're basically testing the, the outflow side. Um, you're replacing right. the inflow side that would normally come from the engine and so on uh, with a, you know, with an external compressor. So um, you're saying it, if that were the problem, then you'd be bypassing that whole troubleshooting. Right. When, when you test it with a pressure cart, you're not testing any of the inflow stuff. Right. You're just testing the, 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 the cabin integrity and the outflow valves and so on. So it, it, as Paul was pointing out, it really depends a lot on what airplane it is. Uh, the twin Cessnas have a very convoluted inflow side yes. with all sorts of flex ducts running through the wings uh, um, with uh, uh, heat exchangers and um, the, the, the cabin heater, the combustion heater up in the nose is part of the pressurization system. Um, and there, there are a bunch of dump valves that, that are part of the pressurization system. And all of this is in the inflow side. And there's just a ton of stuff that can go wrong. Um, whereas the a P210 ha has a dead simple inflow system and there's not very much that can go wrong with it. Um, so in a P210, when there's pressurization problems, it's usually an outflow thing. So it, it's kind of model specific, but, uh, but I, I completely agree uh, that, uh, uh, that with, a, with a twin Cessna, 90% of the time, the, the pressurization problem is going to be with the inflow stuff because there's just so many places that it can leak. So why do they go to the cart? That was his question. Is it yeah. because they're, Be, they're lazy? Because they're just yeah. like spring-loaded to yeah. Yeah, do that. Because it's fun? <laughs> well, to, to do the other stuff, you have to start digging. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, well, let's we can hook up the cart first and start Well, I mean, and there the is leaks. a certain amount to be said for the approach that says let's try the easiest stuff first i mean yes yeah. but certainly in the case of the twin cessna it's it's much more likely that the problem's going to be with the inflow oh. side and and normal kind of troubleshooting if it's been a problem coming on slow for a long time versus something that suddenly occurred that's two yeah, very hard. different types yeah. of troubleshooting mindsets yeah mm -hmm. but those those flexible air ducts can can chafe through uh, the, mm -hmm. they all, they're all attached with big stainless steel hose clamps that can come right. loose. The hose uh, clamps. Just, yeah. And then there's all these dump valves that, yeah. that, that need to be, you know, need to be closed uh, and they need to seal properly. And um, so those are really a, fancy hose clamps too. <laughs> so so there's just it, a lot of, a lot of places to look. It's their troubleshooting is, is, just trying to do the quick fix and get you back out the door, you know, and they aren't putting the time into considering the system as a whole and problems might be. And well, I think they're, they're starting with the, the low cost. Let's go look here first. Mm -hmm. Cause a lot of the stuff that Mike's talking about is buried inside wing roots and, and things yep. like that. So yeah. In the nose where you have to take yeah. a bunch of stuff apart yeah. to get at it. I mean, the, the heater is up in the nose of the airplane. And you have to take, there's a lot of panels that have to come out just to get to the thing. Right. So, yeah, hooking up the cart first is sometimes the 
Sometimes a quick way to go. Which yeah. just goes to prove, well, something we've known for a long time, that the people who design these airplanes are never the people that have to work on. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> at, at one point, I, I had a leaking ram air door, which is also up in the nose that was causing pressurization issues. Uh. And that's right by the heater, as Paul was saying. And my mechanic told me after there, there's a, an O-ring that went bad on it. But my mechanic said, it seems like Cessna built the entire airplane around, around that, that ram yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I, I've, I've, I've always thought that the, up, up in the nose, I've got a 310, but it's, it's a similar situation with a heater up there. That instead of securing that panel with a, a million machine screws, they could have just secured it with Velcro or something. I don't you know. <laughs> it's not like it's structural. It's or not anything. structural. Yeah. yeah, it's not structural. That's yeah. funny. Boy, that's wow. true. That and is with, true. With the dump valves that Mike was mentioning, that there's actually a, a an airborne test that I've run, um, which is kind of interesting and actually helps isolate maybe the inflow side a little bit more. And you can take somebody along, but you should take somebody whom you don't like that much because what you're going to do is you're going to pop the <laughs> rubber. You're going to go up and, pre and, pre and pressurize the cab and, and then pull these dump valves one at a time and see if there's a difference in pressure drop offs. So yeah. um, some of that can be pretty, pretty hard in terms of the depressurization. And, and you know, Toby is making a really good point that's uh, not only about pressurization, but like turbo systems in general those things are very hard to test in the hangar and mm -hmm. much easier to test up in the air, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, we're constantly asking aircraft owners, go, you know, go, go try stuff in the air and tell us what happens because it's really hard to diagnose that stuff on the ground. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll tell you, because I'm real good at telling people how not to do things. So here's what you <laughs> don't do. If you don't, if you don't have a pressure cart, you don't go up in a 414 a, uh, with some guy you found that uh, when vaping was brand new and, <laughs> and have, have them light up their, their fake cigarette and think that you're going to follow the smoke oh. because that doesn't happen. It just completely oh. fogs the entire cabin. Nobody can see anything and you don't find any leaks. Somebody did that? <laughs> I, no, I, I know Paul, a guy. Paul, that's not, that's not the... Don't even suggest the that. The <laughs> procedure is that you get a friend with a big Cuban cigar. A Cuban cigar, yeah. <laughs> and, and then oh, you get another friend who will fly close formation with you <laughs> and see that? where, where the oh, smoke is coming out. That's, that's oh, better. <laughs> neither, neither way, you're going to be able to breathe real good. I, I can just tell you, it's, it's not good air to breathe. Don't, don't and by the way, <laughs> at, those, at those altitudes and that kind of pressure in the cabin, those... Uh, those pipes or whatever those things, the vaping things. I mean, you go through like two packs of them in a heartbeat. It's like, whew, they just go right through. How do you know this, Paul? Yes, that's, I, that's, I, was I know a guy. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't me. I, I, I'm I not the vaping kind of guy, but okay. we found a guy on the airplane that was a big vapor and put him in the airplane. We went up and the, oh the my owner gosh. of the airplane flew it and he started going at it and we had all this smoke and it's like, man, <laughs> <laughs> it was a disaster. Uh, that sight picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, no, there was nothing to see. Okay, yeah, we couldn't I... see each other. We couldn't see out the windows. You were IFR inside the plane. Okay. Inside the plane. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Again, how not to do something. I, I have heard that that troubleshooting procedure, supposed yeah. troubleshooting procedure, and I've heard it with the Cuban cigar, like my cast. Yeah. So, yes. Oh my god, terrible idea. <laughs> I've not tried it, so I, maybe don't, I shouldn't. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Just a bit. Oh, funny. oh man toby right. thanks for calling that was a lot of fun yes yeah. my pleasure thank you for having me i appreciate it i hope the fa wasn't listening <laughs> yeah. take care oh, thanks. Wow. our next question is from scott who doesn't believe everything he reads online go ahead scott <laughs> hey guys thanks for uh having me on uh so i was going through a certain social media site in which i now use just for aviation stuff and one of the groups somebody had posted about how their airplane the starter was bad and they were trying to get someplace and they had it all set up to hand prop and then they had the unlucky lottery ticket of having an faa inspector show up <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> the question then became what's is it legal to operate with that particular piece of equipment inoperative and then it delved into 
well, what can actually be an operative on the airplane and still be airworthy? So the discussion ensued, and I, I think you're going to find this next part very shocking, and I hope you're sitting down. The internet could not agree. No. <laughs> I know. It was really shocking. But it came down to, and I know there'd be some differences depending on, you know, were you experimental, experimental amateur built, CAR3, part, you know, anything like that. No. What is a good baseline for somebody to decide, I have something that's inoperative. Is it okay to fly that way? I got this one. Yeah. yeah all <laughs> Mike's over. all over this. I've Mike been locked and loaded this for this one. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, first of all, uh, there's there's the theoretical aspect of this, and then there's the, the practical aspect of this. The practical aspect of this is that when the FAA inspector comes over and sees you hand propping your airplane and says, what are you doing? What you don't say is, I've got a dead starter and I'm hand propping the airplane to get home. <laughs> right. What you, do, what you do say is, well, the airplane wouldn't start and I assume it's a dead battery. Ah. Uh, so I'm hand propping the airplane. Um, the, 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 the theoretical part uh, comes from a regulation called 91213D, which talks about, um, what inoperative equipment is permissible to fly with. Um, it's a complicated regulation because it's in part 91. It applies to everybody whether whether you're flying an experimental or a certificated airplane doesn't matter uh part 91 applies to everybody sure. um and uh it 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 basically if you read through it and it's fairly long regulation um has a uh it's, it's kind of a, a flow chart that tells you all the questions you have to ask yourself to make a decision as to whether the airplane can be flown with a particular piece of uh, in operative equipment and in operative instruments, whatever. Um, and so, for example, in order to be able to fly with a piece of inoperative equipment, that equipment must not be part of the original certification basis of the aircraft. It must not be explicitly required by uh, 91205, I think it is, which is the thing that says what equipment is necessary for day VFR, night VFR, day IFR, et cetera. Et cetera. And it not, must not be on the, the list of required equipment from the manufacturer or for uh, part 23 airplanes, it, it's, it's what's called a KOEL kinds of equipment list. Uh, that that says what equipment must be working for day VFR, night VFR, uh, day IFR, night IFR. And finally, it must not the the fact that it's inoperative must not present a hazard to flight, which is a subjective standard. Mm -hmm. And if it if it passes all those tests, then it's okay to fly with with the inoperative. Um, I'm pretty sure that the starter was part of the certification basis of the airplane. So the, I, I, in, I looked at the TCDS for the Aronka. It's one for all of them, um, mm -hmm. for the, all the Satabrios. And it looked like it was op optional equipment, which I was kind of surprised on. It, really? It, it listed it in the notes and it talked about what weight and balance change would occur if that starter were added. Oh, fascinating. Is that possible that it, it wasn't? It's possible. Yeah. Because it's so old, maybe. Yeah, that's right. So that would imply at least that that, that part of your uh, checklist here would imply that it meets that criteria, but it might still be on the KOEL. Well, there's not going to be a KOEL for Satabria because it's too old. Oh, okay. Well, that there'll there'll be probably a list of required equipment somewhere. Hmm. Um, in, in the in the POA someplace. Yeah. So my conclusion, based on that, if I read the. Uh, TCDS right would be that it's not required and he was legal to do that. Right. But that's not a generic answer. That's that that's a procedural answer. Yes. Look at the yeah. TCDS right. and try to determine whether the equipment is is required as, as part of the certification basis of the airplane. You know, it, it like I said, it's a complicated regulation. It's it's in part ninety one. Pilots are supposed to be able to figure it out because it because part 91 is addressed to pilots, not addressed to mechanics. 
but it's not, you know, that there aren't a whole lot of owners that even would know how to look up a TCDS. So it's, it's a, it's a difficult regulation to, to, to comply with. Yeah. And it's kind of convoluted too. I mean, it's down, buried down in the notes after each um, model is addressed. Then it talks about all the other things, uh, all, the, all the other equipment that could be installed. But, so. um, you know, and, and if you, if you did, if you did hand prop the airplane and fly home and then there was an FA inspector waiting at the other end for it to ramp check you, then you'd say, well, uh, it broke must, have gone, must have gone <laughs> bad in flight. It wasn't that way when I took off, you know? So. Yeah. So even though if let's, so this starters, obviously a, an optional piece of equipment doesn't have to be working for flight. Could he not just put a placard on the panel somewhere and tell the FAA guy I've placarded it as inoperative and fly as long as he wants to that way. Yeah. It's supposed to be disabled and placarded. And uh, you, I don't know I how you, would... you could argue that it disabled itself. Or <laughs> it, yeah, self or maybe you could pull the breaker and put a tie wrap around it. I yeah. don't know. But I mean, he could have done that would have been just as legal. But I think it would be just better to say, hey, it, it, <laughs> right. it, was, it was working when I took off. You know. So did any of the internet sources come close to what we're concluding? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Not yeah. that and I care. But... Someone saying, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, just shut yeah. your computer off. But, you know, like it. <laughs> Right. Most internet conversations are not the most well balanced, we'll say, but I was just trying to think of, you know, what's a good thumbnail for somebody that has an airplane where something isn't working and needs to get back or, you know, it doesn't yeah. even, you know, can't get it fixed or for a while. How do they know they're safe to and legal to operate? Actually, I, I, I did a, a, a webinar that's on, on our YouTube channel. You could Google um called is is my airplane too broken to fly okay and uh and it, and it kind of walks through this whole 91 213d process very good but it, it sounds it sounds like as usual colleen is the one that actually studied <laughs> as <laughs> looked, usual. At, looked at your tcds and came up with the with the right answer so well, i couldn't remember the koel <laughs> and the inoperative equipment list but i did remember that if it's in the original certification basis for the aircraft right. then it has to be operating yeah. to like be gas legal. tanks right and yeah. the other Oil the pressure other, the other thing it has it it um it you have to look at, at 91205 which is what the part 91 required equipment for different kinds of stuff is yeah very I mean, cool. big airliners are using lists like this all the time when they're sitting at the gate and all the passengers are waiting to go and somebody comes well, in. Well, you see that, you know, all, they, they, yeah. they get minimum equipment lists and they get right. the, approved. Uh, and, and, but the FAA mm -hmm. and in its infinite wisdom won't, won't offer, a, won't issue a, a MEL for part 91 airplane. 91, yeah. Ask me how I know. I tried <laughs> for my airplane and, and they basically laughed me out of the office. Uh, they said, "Oh, we we don't we don't we don't do MELs for for Part ninety one airplanes." So um, that's that's why ninety one two thirteen D exists. It's is it's sort of to provide a kind of a procedural algorithmic MEL for a us poor man's guys, MEL. Yeah, us little guys. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, that was a great question, Scott. And hey, I particularly love that you don't believe what you see on the internet. I wish more people <laughs> use that wisdom. <laughs> Kudos to you. Be careful. This verify. podcast is going to be on the internet. That, so. That's yeah. a quote from so. that's a quote from Abraham Lincoln. Not everything you see on the internet is true. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for calling. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Appreciate it. See thank you, care. Scott. Bye. Yeah, so much fun. Our next question is from Russ, who is ready to fire up the CNC machine. How are you doing, Russ? Pretty good, Paul. Thank you for your time. Yes, I have a. I fly with a friend who has a 1979 Cessna R182. That the lower door hinge on the left side is cracked at the last annual inspection, and the ANP AI guy said that it was so expensive to replace that maybe you ought to consider getting rid of the airplane and oh, parting gosh. it out oh, wow. uh, i looked and i uh, after that i looked and i can find some aftermarket parts and some replacement parts in a junkyard here in phoenix but uh, i thought i could make one and i do have a cnc machine and a scanner 
and I would be interested about owner built parts. And my friend was a little reticent about uh, getting into that and going down that direction. Well, Mike and Colleen are going to dive into this one big time. Oh boy, are yeah. we ever! <laughs> so, but oh, before dear. before I before I jump out of the way, um, just a couple of things. You, we're talking about the the cabin door hinge, correct? Correct. No. Okay, so it's the cabin door hinge. Those are available. You can buy those from Cessna. They are pricey. You can get them out of salvage yards. But the main thing is, once you get this taken care of, keep them lubricated. If you'll keep them lubricated, they won't crack and break like yours has done. So, uh, but so it's the, the, the binding of the hinge pin that has broken it, then is that? Yeah, some, it's it. Know, once it depression? starts to wear, it you have all this friction. And it just constant wear and tear on it, and eventually it, it breaks and comes apart. So, go lubricate the co-pilot side. They don't break as often because they don't get used as often. Yeah. So yeah, keep that really well lubricated, but. The owner produced part is a phenomenal question because it comes up in our shop and hmm. I'm ready to hear how to do this. Hey, hey, Paul, <laughs> just out of curiosity, do you have a, a, a spitball idea of what what Textron wants for that hinge? How proud are it, they of it, that hinge? <laughs> I don't know what I don't know. This is 79 model. I haven't looked that one up on the restart airplanes. The last time I looked for one, it was a couple of grand. Uh, mm. just, and that's just for half of the hinge. Okay. Uh, and they had them in stock, but, uh, so it's, it's a it's totally a, unreasonable, probably not pro probably saying that the airplane should be parted out is a little bit. Over yeah. The that top. was, that was really way over the top um, for a, a couple of thousand dollars I, part. I was but, surprised. And when he talked to me, he got really panicky about what he was going to do other than take the doors yeah. off. Cause I know you can fly it without the doors. But well, that's let, let, let's, <laughs> let's focus, focus on, on the question of the, of the owner yes. produced part. Um, the, the trap you don't want to fall into is to make one uh, to, to try to fabricate one that's better than the yeah. original. Right. Right. You want it, 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 you know, the, the, the key phrase is at least equal to, but if you make it better than the original, that constitutes an alteration. Um, and, and, and then it gets complicated. Then you have to decide whether it's a major alteration or a minor alteration and, and, and stuff. So, um, the, the, the best strategy is if is to re reverse engineer the part and make one that is as identical as it is possible to do made of the same material with the same dimensions and characteristics and so on and it, you, you absolutely are allowed to do to to make an owner produced part to to replace it um but the thing is that that you need to convince an A and P uh, that it's okay to install that owner produced part. And so and in order to do that, he's got to be convinced that it's an airworthy and conforming part. So um, one of the best ways to do that is to, is to get the A and P involved in this whole process, make him your co-conspirator in the creation of the part. And, and, and so, so that when it's done, he's sort of, locked and loaded and ready to, to put it on the airplane, sign it off as airworthy. The, the problem you're going to have, <clears throat> which is the problem that we have is it, owner shows up with an owner produced part. Uh, and like Mike said, if we're not involved in it, we don't have any clue what you did. Did you have any drawings? Did you have any, do you do any testing to make sure it's, um, of equal, uh, uh, serviceability and strength and all that. The other thing is your mechanic is a little afraid to install something that doesn't have a factory part number. Uh, you're going to have to, before you go off making this part, the person that installs the part has the greatest liability in terms, in the eyes of the FAA. If I install a part, then I have to be the one that says, yes, this part is an acceptable part for me to install. So as Mike, uh, alluded to, you're going to have to be sure that your mechanic is going to be willing to install 
whatever it is you fabricate. And that, I think I would start there before I did anything else. Yeah. No, you, you, no. You want to get him involved in, in, in yep. the fabrication of the part so that he, he feels comfortable with it. And, and Russ, Russ is proposing that he could make it out of billeted aluminum versus the stamped aluminum sheet, which is you think that's how it was made. That's I, how I think it was made, but I don't know. You're not sure. I haven't taken it off the airplane. Or I haven't seen it off the plane yet. Are, so, are you able to I remove? Can you remove the part and um, blueprint it somehow so that you've got some kind of, you know, something that you can, are you going to CNC uh, it or are you going to hand machine it? Well, I was going to CNC it. Uh, but I believe it's riveted on. Um, Paul, I'm sure. Yeah, knows. you just drill it off. It's easy to get off. You're going to have to take it out anyway. Yeah, it's on yes, like seven or eight rivets. It's not a lot. Is, is that something uh, A and P has to do is to remove it or just to no. install it? No, anybody can take stuff off. Right. You might. You, can, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, say you can take a chainsaw to the airplane, cut That's the wing right. off, and, and, and not violate any regulations. <laughs> <laughs> I don't recommend it. <laughs> um, yeah. But, okay. But the, the main thing is to focus on making it as exactly the same as the original as possible. Just because you can make it better than what the factory did doesn't mean you should. Because if, if you do, then, then, then you've altered the type design and now you have to justify the, alter, the, the alteration. Or, or what will happen is the hinge itself won't fail next time, but the door around it will fail because <laughs> it was beefier than the door or the, yeah. the you know, the other side. Will, you know, that, so you definitely want to be, yeah. it, it's a balanced system and you want to keep the balance. And you do want to keep yeah, the weight well, balance the ability the to put, uh, put ball bearings in it and all kinds of things if I wanted to, <laughs> but it wasn't going to go that far. I was just oh. looking at machining it out of a out of a solid strap and making it look like it i could even uh, engrave the part number in it if that would make you feel better oh yeah that's, that's a great <laughs> yeah. idea absolutely you know, I, a, I got a laser engraver and wait, i got a wait is that a is that a copyright infringement uh, i don't know yeah, false no he's not uh, selling I, it so it's okay yeah, I, I don't I'm think sure you can copyright a number <laughs> <laughs> I can number it anything I want. It just has to right. be Textron's number too, right? But you know, okay. as as aircraft are getting older, the parts are less available, and the um, the the kind of loophole that we have for a loophole, the rule we have for owner approved an owner supplied part is something to try to take up the slack when parts are not being produced anymore. And as long as they meet the requirements of you know of equal, not equal or better, equal fabrication and equal dimensions. Then it's it's as if you got the part from Cessna, only you paid a lot less money. Hopefully, well, well this we were talking more. about three D printing some interior parts as well. Uh, yeah, no problem with that. I wouldn't think. Um, you well, you need to interior, pay attention in, to materials. The, the good well, part of the the good part about interior parts are 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 that replacing interior parts. Uh, we're talking about. Uh, the like upholstery trim? and the yeah. trim and stuff like that that's that's a preventive maintenance item so you don't have to get an a, an a and p involved you can just do it yourself and, and, and i mean when i say you i mean the owner of the aircraft and sign it off yeah. on his own signature so he doesn't have to convince an a and p that that this is well he might have been talking about a door handle which isn't trim so it depends on no like cup holders that are just oh, broken cup holders. And crazy yeah. Yes, important things, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the little plastic trim around the fuel selector valve is all. I, I, remade, I remade mine uh, exactly that part out of composite. And it's beautiful. And it's much better than the crappy plastic that they, the ABS plastic that they used in the original. So, yeah, those kinds of pieces, we have much better processes now for making. You could even make it out of metal and make it beautiful if you wanted to shape the metal. Yeah. If you had well, a lot of time. Uh, that's interesting, but. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's it's gotten a lot easier with the uh, laser scanners and CNC machines where you can scan the oh, part yeah. if you have a if you have something to start with, and then then it's almost ready to start machining uh, within minutes. So it is something that's available, or you can send it to a three D printer and print it just as well if you desire to do that. Now, so now, Paul, we've been Paul, going, you, talking you, both directions. Paul, you got a bunch of moles in Textron, so. <laughs> what why why do you think they have the audacity to to charge thousands of dollars for a door hinge? Cuz they make one, right? Or two. Uh it it is an interesting uh, I have had a lot of conversations with 
Textron about their parts. They have a form. <clears throat> if we buy a part, oh, let's just imagine it might be a downlock switch for a Cessna 210 that you can find on Mouser because the part <laughs> number is stamped on the side of, right. the, of the switch. Yep. It's a uh -huh. common part. So going to get it at Mouser or Newark or any of those places is totally legit. It's not a, I'm, I'm happy to tell the FA that I go get this part uh, because it is the same, the exact same part. And you can buy it for 250 bucks. At one point, Textron was selling it for around a thousand dollars. So there's a form that service centers can use to say, hey, this is a problem. We can get it aftermarket for this. You send it in and chances are, somebody, an intern or somebody will uh, take it up to some committee and usually within a day or two, the price gets adjusted. Oh, so wow. if McFarlane or someone like that builds this part, which they might, you might want to check that as well. Um, they're one of the biggest producers of replacement parts for airplanes, like these sort of parts. Uh, once they start making it and Cessna is advised that, or Textron is advised that uh, McFarlane makes a door hinge for a half of what Cessna does. Cessna will often bring their price down. So you can challenge those things, yeah, but I'm, they are expensive. I'm a little well, bit surprised be here because it, it was always my impression that the parts that were priced outlandishly were the ones that didn't get replaced very often, you know, right. no, nose gear trunnion or something. But the parts spark. that the parts that regularly wear out and break and 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 the, there's a fairly steady demand for like door hinges, I, I would have expected to be priced more reasonably. Well, that is generally the case because they spread the the setup cost over a larger yeah. quantity of parts. Right. If you want to buy a carry through spar for a two ten, they're going to build seven at a time, and they mm. don't know how long it's going to take them to sell all seven. So for 56 pounds of aluminum, you pay $19,999.99, literally. <laughs> um, but a, a door hinge, you would think, yeah, there's, there's going to be they more. They crack a lot, you know. They do right? crack a lot. Um, I don't know. I would think that we would see more of those get replaced. But, uh, yeah, the price is still pretty high, and I'm not real sure why. Maybe they of course, just there, there, may, there may be a, may be a chicken and egg problem here. It may be because they're priced so high that a lot of people get them from salvage yards <laughs> yeah, and could, yeah. make them themselves. Or that's something. probably <laughs> true, yeah. But at some point, if someone is making one uh, for sale on the open market, uh, that challenge may be what it takes to get the prices down for Dextron. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, I can understand that that downlock switch being four times what you can get it from Mauser for because Textron probably has to pay the same price that you do for Mauser and then right. they got to have a profit and then the distributor yeah. has to have a profit and so on. So, And they really don't want to bother with selling all those little parts. If you can get it aftermarket, yeah. I, for the most part, I think they're happy to do that. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, I, I appreciate your uh, thoughts and comments about it. And uh, uh, yeah, the AMP was uh, okay with the idea. You know, he wanted to see it, of course, before it was installed. But cool. uh, well, obviously, he would see it before it was installed. But he said whatever if it looked good, he would install it. So whatever yeah, you do, just, don't scrap the airplane. No, <laughs> just, just try to just try to make it as 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 identical as you possibly can to the yeah. to the original. Lubricate. Um, back to Colleen's comment about stamp put a versus Zerk on machine. It. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is there any? Is there anything different if the process is different that makes it? Is that going to, you know, it's still up to the ANP though, right? I mean, uh, if I have machine that's out of a solid piece of aluminum versus stamping it, I don't have any way to to as process long as it's that. The same material. I... Well, he won't be able to make it out of the same material more than like. Well, first off, he has to figure out what that is. Yeah. And if you can determine what that is, great. If you call Cessna, they may or may not tell you what it is. Yeah. Uh, they're not going to be excited to do that. They will not give you prints of a part that they still sell. They may not give you prints of a part that they don't sell. Um, so, and that's part of the making the part uh, at least equivalent to the original is if you don't know what the materials are, how do you do that? Because 7075 aluminum is not the same as yeah. a forged piece or a stamped piece or a rolled well there piece. there there are lots of labs in 
including can, yeah. aviation laboratories right. in Houston that you can right. you can send yeah. a little piece of stuff and and they can uh, tell you what what alloy it is. That might yeah. be the best thing so to that, do. I mean, yeah. you're as a owner produced part. That's you're going to have to jump through some of those hoops. It's not just a simple go slap something on the airplane kind of deal. Yeah. That's probably the hardest challenge for you. Making it is probably easier than just figuring mm -hmm. out what it's made out of. Might be. Yeah. yeah. I had given that any consideration. Yeah. All Excellent. right. Thank you. Interesting question. Yeah. I, yeah. I love hearing about people fabricating parts for airplanes. I mean, <laughs> my best friends are machinists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great uh, have we you. have a lot of fun. I build a lot of hot rod parts and some other stuff, but nobody cares about that. You know how that goes. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> Do what you want on that. Yeah. Yep. Appreciate the call, Russ. It was good to, good to talk to you. Our next question is from Frank, who's going down the slippery slope of oil. Go ahead, Frank. Thanks, Colleen, and thanks, everybody. Uh, love your show as an engineer pilot and now a new owner of an old plane. I just love what you guys do and I'm learning so much. So thanks for what you do. Good. My question is that uh, I am, um, I religiously change the oil, get it checked and everything like that. And everything's working great. No problem at all there. But I've heard many great things about synthetic oil. Uh, my two cars, I have uh, one car has 180,000 miles on, another car has 210,000 and I use synthetic oil all the time. So I love it. Um, I'm also lucky to be at an airport, based at an airport that uses, that has MOGAS a good, reliable supply of MOGAS. I have the STCs and I use MOGAS whenever I can, uh, getting the lead out, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I'm really happy about that. So I understand that with synthetic oil, you can't run 100 low lead. And so what I did is I went back and looked at the first year and a half of ownership and I'm running at about 20%, just under 20% of 100 low lead versus MOGAS. And that's mostly because when I fly, you know, out of my airport and other places, it's not as easy to get MOGAS or unleaded fuel. So my question then really is, is there a magic percentage where I shouldn't use synthetic oil? Or if you use any 100 OLED, you shouldn't use synthetic oil at all? What, what kind of airplane are you flying? Uh, Cessna 182. It's two years young, uh, younger than me. <laughs> it's okay. So it's a certificated airplane. Um, yeah, 0470, yeah, with an 0470R. Well, the, the the reason I ask is that, that, at least to the best of my knowledge, there is presently no full synthetic aviation, uh, piston aviation oil on the market. Uh, Mobile used to have one back in the day. Um, Ooh. And they got, they got sued off the market in a hail of uh, class action lawsuits because it wrecked so many engines. Of course, everybody was running on 100 low lead back then. Um, but... Uh, there, there are full synthetic automotive oils, but you don't want to use automotive oil in an aviation engine because uh, they use um, metallic a additives that 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 uh, create um, um, ash and stuff in aircraft engines that, that's harmful. So you don't want to use um, an automotive full synthetic oil in an aircraft engine. And as far as I know, there are no full synthetic uh, piston aircraft oils uh, on, on the market anymore. I, I expect that once we complete our transition to unleaded fuel, which I would guess is going to be at least five years, um, somebody, I, probably not mobile, but somebody, Shell or Phillips or somebody is going to, is going to come forth with a, with an all uh, synthetic piston aviation oil again, but presently uh, none are available. So the, the, probably the best you can do is to is to run a semi synthetic like Aeroshell 15W50, which and, is what uh, I run now. Yeah, and that, and and you know I, I'm not a big fan of 15W50 in engines that are running primarily on 100 low lead. But if you're only running 20 percent of the time, I think you'd be fine with. So what's the, the magic Aeroshell. percentage, Mike? Is it 50 50? I don't I don't know that there's a magic percentage, Colleen. We 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 have. The, the 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 worst combination that we have the ones that are really pro uh, troublesome are um large displacement engines with small oil sump capacities like the engine in the cirrus or the columbia or something where you've got this big monster 550 cubic inch engine 
with, with an oil sump that, that only holds eight quarts and nobody runs it over six because it blows the top two quarts out the breather. Um, and so you're asking a small amount of oil to absorb a large amount of lead laden blow by. Um, and uh, uh, synthetic oil doesn't, doesn't handle that very well. Syn synthetic oil is wonderful in every respect, except for the, its inability to handle um, uh, lead from, from, uh, from blow by. And once we get rid of the lead, that problem's going to go away. Um, but but f for now, um, so th this is a Cessna 182, Correct. which is a, a lower displacement engine, 470 cubes, and has a, a pretty good-sized oil sump. It's either 10 or 12 quarts? 12, 12 quarts. So which wow. you probably run around 10, right? Yeah, it, it, um, it, sit, it sits right at about 11 is where, where it yeah. sits, yeah. So, okay. so you you probably don't have a particularly terrible case, uh, even even running a semi synthetic, and especially if you run MoGas a lot. Um, so I think you're in good good shape. Great, yeah. I I just got out of my annual and did, did the bore scopes and everything looks great. And so mm -hmm. yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. So uh, yeah, just uh, you know, like I said, I I've, I've I've got old cars and I have an old plane, and <laughs> you know, I just want to keep them both running, uh, you know, as as, as long as possible. Well, I'm a big Skyland lover, so yeah. I know you are. I've, you, made, you, made, you made a good I, choice. <laughs> I, I'm. I, I couldn't be happier with it. I, I. I definitely was lucky. I got in before the big price went up. So yeah. Oh wow. Oh well, good for you. Yep. Yes. Mike, what model was your 182? Mine was an L, I think. L. Okay. It's a, it a 68. Okay. I bought I'm it. the 63 Foxtrot. Yeah, I, I I picked it up brand new at the Cessna Delivery Center <laughs> in Wichita, wow. 25 years old, and I flew it home, and man, my head was in the clouds. <laughs> that was exciting. I, I still had it. The, the books were really good with this, and it came with the original uh, sheet, the weight and balance, and all of the equipment that came with oh, it yeah. in 1963. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. really cool looking at the history of everything. I will say all of those I, ARC radios that, yeah, that's yeah, right. that's right. <laughs> yeah. anymore. I did have it, uh, a new weight and balance done on it. And like, I guess everybody, it gained 60 pounds over the years. And oh, don't <laughs> weigh them. What it don't yeah. weigh them. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> don't I, weigh I, them. And that's after <laughs> yeah. I've taken out the vacuum pump and put in two G fives and a, and a, a GFC oh, wow. 500. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm guessing it's just, you know, the dirt and stuff, you know, over, dirt over under the, the seats. Yeah. No, <laughs> actually I had a Q model for several years and wonderful airplane. And I made the mistake of weighing it. And uh, I tried to talk myself into ignoring it, but I, I couldn't, but yeah, they Can don't, you? I don't think they gain weight. I think it's uh, now, I think Cessna weighs every airplane off the line, but back in the day, they only weighed sample airplanes, ah. like every 10th airplane or so. And the rest were calculated. So because oh, they, they were, they were popping them off the line so quick. Yeah. Oh, they were. Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine uh, in 1963, the guys at Cessna, if somebody told them, hey, this airplane you just built is still going to be flying in 2022, they would have right. thought you were crazy. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I was two years old when it was built, and so I'm thinking the same thing, you know? Yeah. And yeah. I, I mean, Basically. It's, it's crazy. It, 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 it's crazy, but it's uh, it's a very clean plane. And yeah, I just I just got back from, I, I did a trip to Denver. And, I'm in Kansas City, so I did a trip to Denver and back, Cleveland and back, and Dallas and back over the last month. And uh, wow. it just, it, it's amazing. It, it's just an amazing traveling machine. And yeah, it really is. You know, it's yeah. not fast. It's not it's it, it's not sexy, if you will, but it is absolutely practical, and it's exactly yeah. what what works works for me. It'll yeah. lift anything. It close the doors on, and it's very it's a really stable instrument platform. Yeah. All just, right, this is turning into a love fest. Yeah. With <laughs> no, we like cardinals too. Yeah, <laughs> I'm doing the. They uh, have sexier lines. Okay, yeah. they do. Yeah, cardinals. It's a good looking. I airplane. love my Cessna. Let's just put That's, it there. There you yeah. go. Yeah. I'm doing the, uh, the systems and procedures course for the restart 182. It's about three weeks in Tulsa. Hmm. And I don't have to, it's kind of nice that class because that's 1996 and newer. When I do the legacy class, which would include your airplane, it's, it's a little hurtful, but I have to start the class. So I set expectations by telling everyone they own an antique <laughs> and about half of the class, you just see their face, their whole countenance, just, it just drops it's in, because they know what that means. The other half of the class are younger pilots 
and they don't know what that means. And they, they think, think it's cool. They <laughs> think it's cool because they haven't owned an antique like some of the maybe older people in the class have. Well, it may be an antique in age, but when I looked through, you know, looked at the the inside of the fuselage all the way there, it's just clean as a whistle. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. it's, you know, I, you know, there, there's something to be said about that. And by the way, I do want to take your course. Well, I, I've, I've watched the video and, oh. <laughs> uh, and I, I do want to actually come down and, and, and take that course. And of course, I read all of Mike's books and. Colleen, I don't know. I, do you have videos or books out? I have to figure out what I what I can do with you, for for you. <laughs> I don't do any self promotion. No, I okay. leave it to the experts. <laughs> oh, yeah. she edits everything. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> well, Hi. great. That was uh, very interesting. I uh, did you really mean full synthetic or did you mean semi synthetic when you asked the question? I, I meant full synthetic because that's did. what I use okay. in, in in my cars. In and, your cars, and, okay. Yeah, right. and just didn't know. I use fifteen W fifty now, so it, yeah. it is what I use now. And so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to know if that was. So I'm doing the best I can right now. And that's perfect. That's what yeah. I'll keep doing. Good, good. Well, thank you for the question. It was very interesting and it was fun talking about your airplane, Frank. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Good afternoon, Frank. Right. Next question is from Ryan, who's trying to see the light. Good to see you, Ryan. Hey, nice seeing you all. Thank you for having me on. Uh, my call, Colleen. I, uh, have, I think I've watched every episode of your show or watched, listened to. It's usually my workout mix, believe it or not. So oh, that's when okay. I'm on a treadmill or elliptical, that's uh, that's what I'm listening to is aviation. So, yeah. Cool. Die hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. So thank you for having me on. Um, you know, these questions, there's two, maybe three that I'm going to throw at you here. And first one is, I'm a flying club member. I'm not going to mention the club, but we have two planes. We have a Cessna, Cessna 172 and a uh, Piper Cherokee 140. Both of them have 160 horsepower uh, Lycoming engines. Um, you know, I'd like to be part of the flying club maintenance program. Uh, as their, but I would be their single maintenance officer. And the club has not um, embraced the idea of adding a liability umbrella or something to the uh, flying club board members. I have a friend who told me since I'm not AMP to stay away from it uh, and not give any maintenance advice in that role or in any role within the club. And, um, you know, I, I'm with the Civil Air Patrol too, and I, I did a short stint as a Civil Air Patrol maintenance officer. However, when acting in that role, I know I'm covered by the government's insurance, and I know A&Ps always review any recommendation I have. So any thoughts on that? Um, just in whether you should get involved or... Yeah, well, more so, more so about the flying club and like, well, my, my theory is not to be involved as the maintenance person since I'm not an EMP. And since they won't put any insurance on the board members to do so. Well, most of the uh, maintenance officers that I hear of from flying clubs are not AMPs. They're okay. just a, a flying member that is going to dedicate some time to understand what's going on with the airplane. They're the director of the They're the director. Right? Yeah. They don't, yeah, you're, you're not going to make decisions about certain things. You're still operating on the part 91 side. Your mechanic that you hire is still the part 43 side. Okay. Right. And so you, you're, you're playing the same role for the flying club that, that an aircraft owner would play for, right. for yeah. a, a personally owned airplane. Okay. Yeah, my worry, my, my wife's an attorney, so I always worry about life. Oh, now yeah. we know. <laughs> uh, you know, it probably would, would be a good idea, and I suspect this would happen anyway, that, that any really major decisions, uh, maintenance decisions that are made, like, for example, when to take an engine out of service and, and, and have it overhauled or, or replaced, would be something that you'd want to take to the board and have the board uh, vote on so it's not your sole decision but okay. you know minor stuff i don't i don't see any real problem but if you're monitoring the maintenance or managing the maintenance um you're telling the amp you're giving authorizing him to do things and taking his um observations you know for action um hits his um signature in the logbook 
So it's his liability. If you're saying that they're counseling you not to even give him advice or to voice an opinion, I think that's crazy because yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, the AMP can take it or leave it. It's his signature in the logbook, but I don't know any AMP that would just blow you off entirely and say, I, I don't need your advice. I'm, I'm going to do it the way I, I mean, think I, I think all it. three of us are strong believers that, that, that maintenance decisions should be not be left to AMP mechanics. Ab absolutely. Yeah. And that was kind of my thought too. You know, um, the, the only thing that I, I see since I'm not the sole flyer of the plane, you know, I'm not the primary owner, you know, if, I, I guess I just worry about, hey, I, if I miss something, am I, and somebody, God forbid, gets in a wreck, am I going to be on the hook for anything? Well, so you're not, here. here's the thing. Of course, Savvy Aviation, we manage, I mean, that's what we do. We, we manage stuff. And one of the things that I learned uh, when uh, we first, when I first got involved in this, when Mike started this back in 2008, I'd never worked at another shop before, so I didn't know how other shops operated. And the, the concept of the owner making the airworthiness decisions was sort of a, it wasn't a new concept. It was a little bit new to me because before that, I was always the aircraft owner and I was doing maintenance on my airplanes that I had purchased and was going to repair and all that. So as the manager, though, the you're not making the decision whether something is an airworthiness issue or not. That's the mechanic's job or the inspector's job. It goes in for an annual. The inspector determines that the compressions are too low. They did a bore scope and found a burn valve. Uh, and therefore, some action has to be taken. Now you can get involved and make a decision. The uh, mechanic should offer, well, we can lap the valve. We can do this. We can do that. We can put a gold plated cylinder on, we can put a silver plated cylinder. <laughs> and those are the options that you get to be involved in because those are financial decisions. The airworthiness decisions are, that's what the, the mechanic is doing. And you really want to take the burden off of your mechanic from making the airworthiness financial decisions. They make the, uh, they determine if something is airworthy and then you get to get involved as to how to react to that. How much money you're going to spend to fix this thing? Are you going to buy a used part, new part? And and I don't see a particularly large liability in that. As Colleen said, at the end of the day, the mechanic has to sign the law books, and that's where the liability is. Okay. Well, the answer is question one. I thank you for that. Question two on our Cherokee 140. Wait, are we, we giving a, are we giving a volume of discount? A no volume questions. discount. <laughs> okay. Well, this is the good question. So. Oh, okay. Uh -oh. Uh, sorry, Wait, I had a call come in at the same time. Okay. Um, can you still hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, we have a Cherokee 140. It has an intermittent landing light problem. Now, this uh, to preference this in the at the when I submitted this question. Uh, it was right around the annual. That was in March, um, and I squawked it for the AMP to check out. Uh, they checked it out. They took out the annual, and the light still was not working when it was really, really cold out. So what I did is I went in, I took a space heater with me, fired up a space heater, put it against a fuse panel, and uh, the landing light turned on when the uh, space heater heated up the fuse panel and the cold hanger there. Um, so I think I identified the problem being the fuse. Um, is there any way to reset the fuse or is that something like where we need to get a new fuse put in? And the reason I ask is our AMP is a little uh he's he's a slight bit difficult to work with um <laughs> is this is this literally a fuse or is it a circuit breaker circuit breaker circuit breaker oh yeah, circuit breaker. oh that's yeah, yeah. that's what i meant yeah because i was going to say it's a fuse you're allowed to change that yourself sure yeah, yeah. but i meant I, a circuit breaker i need the a and p to change there's i don't think there's any way to reset the circuit they'll get it to pop nor you, do i think i want to do that do i 
You can test them by driving them with a power source, but those circuit breakers, I can speak from my airplane, they get old and they get crotchety and um, you can't and, count on them to break when they're supposed to. And, so, and these are these, those horrible uh, non-pull non breakers yeah, that should correct, have never yeah. been allowed in an airplane. Right. Yeah. So I would yep. just bite the bullet and it's not that expensive. Just update the circuit breaker, just replace yep. it. Yeah. And okay. and you you can replace one of those circuit breakers with a pullable one without. Yeah. It's, yeah it won't yeah. physically that, fit the that, same, but it'll oh, do really? a good job. You can, make, you can bend the bus bar to kind of get it in there. I mean, yeah. It, mm. You may have to use yeah. a little jumper or something. Because I, I always, I always thought that that non-pullable circuit breakers should never have been certified because uh, it gives you no way of disabling a circuit if if there's like a smoke in the cockpit or something like that. Yeah, you need to shut something off. Yep, no options. Hmm. Yep, circuit breakers are easy. Yeah. Okay. I, that's and you, and, and you can buy it and hand it to your mechanic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so just and then aside, breathe down his neck while he's. <laughs> yeah, well, just as a side note, I'll throw out some numbers for you. Our last annual on the 172 was 15 grand from this mechanic. Uh, well, he had to install a new elevator, so a right elevator, so that was five right there, and do some mags. But he charges about three grand to look at it, and um, it's a convenience fee for being on the field. So yes. The 140 was 10 grand. So, well, he's yeah. a little pricey. I, yeah. I, I would say this shop needs to be kept on a shorter leash than yeah. it's being kept on. It's probably because there's no maintenance officer there's, in the club. There's so no he's maintenance just running officer. rampant and doing anything he wants to. That's exactly what it is. Someone <laughs> needs to manage the shop. That's, and that's, that's your job. That's Ryan. your job. That's the owner's job. Okay. Fair yeah. enough. Hold on. Start, start counting noses and kicking butt. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> So that's why I'll, I'll start working on this year. Now, what's the third a, question? A fancy that was new the third. engraved shirt that, that Ooh. says has your name on it and says maintenance officer. And you know, Ooh. officer sounds no. much more intimidating than manager. Yeah. Definitely yes. go for maintenance officer. Yes. I, I'll wait till I retire and then become a. See, I, I'm thinking about becoming an A and P, and it's mainly because of your podcast. So. Oh no! Don't be blaming us for that. Well, it'd be more of a hobby than a job. Yeah, no, I was going to say it's great to become an A and P. Just don't do it for a living. This is, yes. Paul will unless, tell you. Unless you want to come work at my shop, we could we could use some A and P's. <laughs> anyway, I appreciate your guys' time. Thank you very much, and yeah. uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, appreciate Ryan. the call. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Well, that's a wrap on another fun podcast. What did we get right? And more importantly, what did we get wrong? We know you've got an opinion and we'd love to hear from you. Please keep sending us those tricky questions and try to stump us. You can send your questions and comments to podcasts at aopa.org. We'll see you. Bye, everybody. Bye.